Now move to the final debate uh, initiated by the Honourable Gentleman, the member for North Avon, and the subject is power generation from the River Severn. I call Mr. Steve Webb. Thank you very much, Sir Nicholas, and good afternoon to you. Um, the timing of this debate couldn't be more appropriate, and I'm very grateful to have obtained the opportunity to raise with the House the issue of power generation from the Severn in its broadest sense. I deliberately didn't call this the Severn Barrage or 15 Things You Didn't Know About Tidal Lagoons. Um, the idea of the debate is really to say that there seems to be an overwhelming case for making far more use than we do at present of the tidal power of the River Severn and to urge the government to take a lead with this idea. Um, the timing of this debate is significant for two reasons, Sir Nicholas, one of which the Minister will be familiar with, the other not. Um, he will know that an energy white paper is due imminently. Um, I hope that the ink is not quite dry on it uh, and that my representations, even at this late stage in the process, will encourage him to ensure that a serious publicly funded appraisal of the options, the benefits and the costs of different forms of power generation from the seven is an important feature of that document and that's one of the principal reasons why I've sought this debate now. <clears throat> Um, a second uh, reason why this timing is particularly appropriate that the Minister may not be aware of is I've just consulted extensively my own constituents. Um, I have emailed several thousand of them to ask for their views on the question, do you in principle support a seven barrage? And that was the question I posed. And I posed it in that way not because I have a closed mind on that issue, as will become apparent I don't, but I felt that if I simply said, should we get more power from the seven, I was in danger of one of those... Um, newspaper phoning polls where the answer is 100% yes and nil no, and I didn't think that would be very helpful. So, so I specifically asked the question, um, did people in principle support a seven barrage? But my constituents in their ever creative manner when they responded uh, said yes and then said in their comments, but of course I don't mean a barrage, I mean something slightly different. So I had to interpret the results carefully. But I received over 1,500 replies from my constituents, unique answers. And the majority in favour of the principle, and I should explain that I asked the question as neutrally as a politician can ever ask a question. Uh, I provided links to the arguments in favour. I provided internet links to the arguments against. So, for example, there were links in my initial question to the RSPB site and the World Wildlife Fund and so on. So they had the opportunity, those who wished to, to read both sides of the argument before coming to their judgment. And by a majority of six to one there was support in my constituency for the principle, in fact, of a barrage, although, as I say, the nuanced replies were slightly more uh, complex than that. Now, what's very interesting is the variety of people who've supported this principle. Um, constituents of mine who are very pro-nuclear still thought that a barrage or a tidal power scheme is a good thing, just as much as constituents of mine who are very anti-nuclear. And we have the interesting position of being a constituency with a, t with a coast along the Severn, and a nuclear power station. So we have a lot of local interest in, in energy matters. Um, so as I say, being pro-tidal power from the Severn doesn't mean that you are uh, in any particular faction on wider aspects of the energy debate. It appeared to be a very broad um, spectrum of local opinion. And I think I should also add that when I've previously consulted my constituents on other issues, the issue of tidal power from the Severn is probably the biggest spontaneous write-in response I've ever had. I think we all know when we do surveys and so on, one or two people might spontaneously fill in a blank box with an idea. But when person after person says, never mind that, what about tidal power from the seven? You start to realise what a, if I might use the phrase, a groundswell of support there is for this general idea. So, um, just to set the context, I'm sure the Minister will be familiar, but just, just for the record, um, we're talking about an estuary with the second largest tidal range in the country. And as many of my constituents who still, although I've, I've reached the grand old age of 41, regard me as being sort of a bit wet behind the ears, tell me that these issues have been talked about for a very long time indeed. Um, that even as recently as the 1970s, the dear old Central Electricity Generating Board uh, undertook a study. And at that time, the argument was that because oil was cheap, we didn't need a, um, power from the seven. At the 1981, the seven barrage committee looked at a range of locations, and one of the things that you start to discover is there is no such thing as the seven barrage. It could go in various locations. And interestingly, that committee recommended a barrage location that wouldn't necessarily be the one that generated the maximum power. 
And again, there's an interesting trade-offs here, that there are full-blown, all-singing, all-dancing schemes way down the estuary that block the entire thing off, that, that go for miles, that generate huge amounts of power, but probably have the maximum environmental knock-on, down to you know, a few lagoons in a few bays that have very limited environmental damage, but perhaps much less potential for generating power. And part of my point in urging a, a fast and substantive cost-benefit analysis, essentially, is that there are so many trade-offs here. Um, we can maximise the power potential, but we may also thereby do more environmental harm than we're willing to do. And, and, and I think the important thing about this is not to come at it doctrinally, but to come at it independently, almost pragmatically, really, and, and just simply say with a blank sheet of paper, I mean, it's not a blank sheet of paper because it's been gone over many times before, but not to, not to commit oneself in advance to a particular answer, because in a sense, you know, the technology is evolving all the time, the energy market's changing all the time, and it really needs someone to take a hard, up-to-date look. Because the biggest substantive study seems to have been the one at the end of the 1980s, Sir Nicholas, uh, undertaken by um, groups including the Seven Tidal Power Group. And they came up with a barrage idea that would be a 10-mile barrage stretching from Lavernock Point near Cardiff to Breen Down near Western Supermare. And... This, just to give an idea of the scale we're talking about here, that barrage was envisaged to provide electricity equivalent to 5% of the UK's entire electricity needs. It was costed in those days at, at £8 billion. Uh, You might double that number on, on Olympic budgeting. You might triple it, perhaps. Um, but it is a technology that is familiar. It's been in operation at La Rance in France for 40 years, albeit on a much smaller scale. Um, it, could cost, it could take 8 to 10 years to construct, but could last over a century. You know, this, this, is the, this is familiar technology, albeit on a larger scale than has been envisaged before. At that time, again, the idea was shelved, and there seems to be a certain almost tidal flow to this idea. Um, but at that point, high interest rates were an issue. Um, but since then, energy costs of other sources have risen. Desire for renewables has risen. Concern about CO2 emissions have risen. So again, we're, we're in a very different world. And it's worth mentioning that the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution when looking at different scenarios to reduce UK greenhouse gases by 2050, included some form of seven tidal power in three of its four principal scenarios. So this is very much a mainstream idea, and I think an idea whose time has come. And the Minister's own department last year in its energy review said on tidal impoundment schemes that these schemes, brackets such as barrages and lagoons, and tidal current technologies, and I quote, have the potential to make a significant contribution to carbon reductions. Um, but when do we move from potential to actual? Part of the thrust of this debate today is to get a steer from the Minister. Obviously, I don't want him to break, well, I do, uh, break the embargo on his white paper. But when are we going to actually move? People say to me, you know, we've heard it all before. Uh, it's been talked about for 30 or 40 years. This is just more talk, more hot air or whatever. Um, and the question is, when are we actually going to get action? Now, I don't only want to talk about barrages, but obviously that's the one that, that grabs the headlines. And it's worth saying that on the face of it, there are a number of attractions of a barrage-type scheme. Clearly, tidal power through a barrage is tremendously predictable. You know, we know the times of the tides, we know the scale of the tides, we know when the electricity is going to be generated, we know when it's not. As compared with perhaps some other forms of renewable energy, it's far more predictable. <clears throat> I mentioned the substantial scale of what could be achieved and the saving of literally millions of tonnes of CO2 every year, which has to be very welcome. It's clearly a secure domestic source of power, and, and in a changing and troubled world, I think many of us would sleep better at night, um, even those of us who live near the River Severn, if we knew that we weren't de dependent quite so much on imported sources of power. It's clearly a very clean source in the sense that there's no long issue of long-term waste disposal. And one of the interesting little uh, things that came up from the responses from my constituents, Sir Nicholas, is the suggestion that a barrage could be used as part of the transport infrastructure. Uh, it's been suggested there could be a rail route across it. Uh, some of my more pessimistic constituents have noted that the Seven Bridge, which is in my constituency, is rusting. Uh, and they feel that um, sooner or later it's going to rust away and therefore we might need another route across. I, I rather hope we'll act sooner than that. But... Um, the, the potential for using a barrage as a part of a transport infrastructure is, is an important one. The potential for flood, flood protection is one that will, I think, be a growing concern to coastal constituencies and, again, is, is one where there is potential. And a double-edged one here, but clearly the construction of a barrage and the potential consequential tourism, water sports and so on is huge, though double-edged for reasons I'll come back to. So 
you can see why this sort of idea is, is very attractive to people. The big reservation people have is what are you going to do to the environment in a very special place. The Seven Estuary obviously has many environmental designations already, more under consideration. There are national and international laws and obligations which would be absolutely rightly central to any appraisal. And this is why I say, as someone who is very interested in the issue but by no means claims to be an expert, I don't know the answer as to whether the environmental costs would outweigh the potential benefits of the various schemes. And that's why I want to see this work looked at through, as it were, modern eyes, through the way that we now look at the marine environment, the way we now look at the coastal environment, which has moved on very greatly since the last comparable study. There are concerns, I know the Honourable Member for Stroud, who represents Slimbridge, is hostile to the barrage idea um, because he's concerned about the mudflats further up the estuary. You can't do something on this scale without a big impact on the ecosystem. Now, there are arguments both ways on this. Some people say, well, actually, if you've got less tidal flow, then there's less sediment being disturbed. That means that the water becomes clearer. That means more sunlight gets through to the, to the, to the riverbed. That means more life grows on the riverbed. That means you get more plant life, more fish life, and more birds. Now, I wouldn't particularly have thought of that, and that argument has been put to me. But there's an interesting RSPB observation on this, and I just quote from their briefing here. A greater abundance of more common species, which is what I'm talking about there, is not a substitute for the loss of scarcer species, as well as a rare habitat that is an important resource for migrating wildlife. And these are very difficult things to weigh up. If it becomes more hab habitable for some sorts of wildlife, but damages a habitat for others, and there aren't so many like that elsewhere, how do you weigh these things up? But what is clear is that we need to get down to specifics. And indeed, since this was last fully appraised, even the arguments about the birds have changed because the patterns of migration have changed, the birds that are in the estuary have changed. This is very much a moving feast, and that's why I think we need up-to-date analysis. The issue about cost, the view is, interestingly, that the cost of an appraisal of the sort I'm talking about, the cost of getting it through the planning system, is probably difficult for the private sector to bear. And this is the question about the role of the government. But the actual construction cost and operation is commercially viable, certainly according to the Seven Tidal Power Group. In other words, it's not something that nobody, I think, is saying that the government should build a barrage or build some of these tidal schemes. But the government probably does have to act as a coordinator, bringing together, I mean, clearly the Welsh Assembly government will have a key interest and role in all of this. I think the Welsh Secretary himself is a great advocate. Um, there's an awful lot of coordination going to have to go on. Somebody's going to have to take the lead, and I see the minister as that person. I think his innate leadership skills are called upon at this moment um, to be the person who steps into the breach. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to him stepping into that mantle, if you can step into a mantle in a moment. Um, potential problems also. As I mentioned, development. Clearly lots of jobs, you know, and you, uh, somebody who replied to my email survey said, you know, it'll be like the south coast, only cheaper kind of thing. I don't know about that. Um, but it could easily be inappropriate development as well. This is a very sensitive estuary area, very environmentally sensitive. We don't necessarily want... Um, a whole raft of development alongside it. So there's, there's a balance to be had there. And obviously the effect on shipping, again, it depends where in the estuary you put the barrage, but if it's below, for example, the port of Bristol and, and other ports, then clearly that needs to be considered. But certainly it's so easy for this debate to be dominated by the barrage, and clearly there are a whole variety of other approaches which I think deserve active consideration. Environmental groups such as Friends of the Earth are supportive of different forms of tidal power, and I urge the Minister to make sure that they're properly appraised, because I've seen their appraisals which say actually tidal lagoons are a better bet than a barrage. I've seen the, the construction companies who might build a barrage say their bet, you know, their scheme's much better than lagoons and they won't make any power, and I don't know. And it needs somebody independent who knows what they're talking about to resolve these issues and give us some definitive answers. The principal alternative appears to be man-made tidal lagoons that fill and empty through turbines. They do so uh, on the ebb and on the flow of the tide. Smaller power potential, perhaps, on each one, but less environmental damage as well. Um, there's some suggestion that when the Oldbury Power Station site in my constituency is decommissioned, that that site, which is coastal, might be used for a scheme of this sort. 
Now, the Tidal Electric Company, who I believe hold a patent on Tidal Lagoons, are already looking at options for doing this sort of thing in Swansea Bay, I gather. And one of the interesting things about lagoons, again, one of my constituents said to me, look, the problem you've got is we need base load power generation, and tidal power is not base load power generation. But one of the interesting things about lagoons is, to some extent, they can be used to time shift. There's a certain potential for shifting the point at which the tides flow to the point at which the electricity is generated, albeit you can only hold back the tide for a certain length of time. People have also raised underwater marine current turbines, you know, literally just sticking a turbine, well, literally underwater. And these don't necessarily have to be alternatives. For example, the underwater turbines could be combined with a barrage. It doesn't have to be either or. So where do we go next with this, Sir Nicholas? The Sustainable Development Commission is looking at UK tidal resources now, including seven tidal power, and it's due to report in mid-2007. But what I fear is we get another report saying wouldn't it be interesting, this is an idea worth further investigation, you know, the classic academic, we need more research. And the question is, when is somebody going to bite the bullet? When is somebody actually going to drive this forward and try and resolve this matter once and for all? I believe we need an appraisal that looks at the different options, barrages, lagoons, underwater turbines, looking at different locations, and looks at the economic and environmental costs and benefits of each. There is considerable cross-party support. Um, I mentioned the Welsh Secretary. I attended a briefing recently given by the Seven Tidal Power Group where there was a Welsh Labour MP in favour. It was hosted by a Conservative MP, myself, my honourable friend for Bristol West, has been a promoter, Bristol City Councillor, promoting, I know, honourable members from around the area are very interested in the scheme. So it's not, I think, a party political issue, but it's one that many of us who have an interest in the Seven Estuary want to see taken forward. And it seems to me, Sir Nicholas, that the role of the government, and this minister in particular, is to be a driving force. Instead of letting it drift, let's have some real power. Call the Minister for reply to this most interesting debate. Sir Nicholas, Mark I think, awaits. Sir Nicholas, I think it has been a, a very, very interesting de debate. And um, I, I, well, I'd better try to maintain the, the interest level as best I can. There was a time, Sir Nicholas, I, I thought I would be destined forever to debate social security and pensions with the honourable gentleman from North Avon until one day, hopefully far advanced, our, we, our, our last winter fuel payments arrived, as it were, um, <laughs> and for reasons of mortality, no more, no more came. So it, it's um, not that they were not fascinating debates, but this, this is also a very interesting one, and um, therefore I'm grateful for the Honourable Gentleman for securing this debate. Um, he obviously takes a very keen interest in this one. Uh, I did know about his survey, because I monitored him very carefully. Um, I'm not always using satellite technology at the moment, but that will come. And uh, so we did know about the survey. I, I didn't realise so many had, had, however, responded. Hopefully not paying £1.50 per call. I'm sure the <laughs> honourable, honourable gentleman's ethics would have um, precluded that. I, I thought his findings were very interesting. And um, I better not talk about rising tides of support because I think he's outpunned everyone so far um, in, in, in this debate. I won't try to f follow him. Let, let's, just, let's just set the context, however, which I know the honourable gentleman is aware of, but just for as it were, the record. Um, the energy challenges we face were recently set out in the, in the energy review, uh, and they will continue to be the main policy drivers uh, for the energy white paper, which will be published um, shortly, indeed, in May. Um, from the start, our objective has been to put us in a better position to tackle what are really the two major long-term challenges for UK energy policy. First, and I think foremost, is to tackle climate change. Um, global carbon emissions are continuing to grow and in addressing climate change we face arguably uh, the biggest challenge facing human civilization. and I think for once the, 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 the speaker does not exaggerate when I, when I say that. And second, we need to ensure a secure supply of clean and affordable energy, not least as he has indicated when uh, globally uh, we now need to think in terms of Britain's energy security and not just energy supply. And the Honourable Gentleman has made that point himself in his own way. The Energy Review published last year set out a wide-ranging strategy for delivering our energy goals, a strategy to which low-carbon technological innovation and expansion in renewable energy are, of course, um, central. Now, since 2002 around £500 million has been committed to help develop low-carbon technologies. 
Building on this, government will substantially increase funding for low carbon energy research and development through the, the new Energy Technologies Institute. The public-private sector joint venture will have funding of up to one billion over a period of 10 years. Uh, we've also created a new environmental transformation fund that will help support renewables and other technologies through demonstration stage and beyond. Our main support mechanism for achieving the necessary expansion of renewables is the renewables obligation, which government introduced in 2002. And under the RO, the renewables obligation, we have seen renewable generation more than double, with the UK joining a small band of countries to have installed two gigawatts of wind energy. But we want to ensure this increase continues and we will publish our proposals to further strengthen the obligation, the renewables obligation, with the energy white paper next month. Now, let me talk about tidal power um, and, and the Severn estuary, um, something which I know has a great deal of interest to a number of members of this House, both representing Welsh and English constituencies, as has been acknowledged. Um, I, I'm, I'm grateful therefore again for the Honourable Gentleman to enable us to um, debate this issue, albeit briefly. It may be useful for those not well acquainted with the subject to understand that there are differences between tidal barrage, barrages and the emerging tidal stream technologies currently being developed under the DTI's technology programme. Um, put simply, tidal barrages are, are, are similar to the hydroelectric dams with which we are all familiar. Uh, it says here, some more familiar than, uh, <laughs> than others, but I've uh, certainly um, um, seen these um, in operation in, in Scotland. I, I'm still searching in Croydon, but um, uh, most of us are familiar with this. Um, uh, and so fundamentally work by impounding a body of water, which is then released through turbines to produce electricity. Uh, a variation on this is a technology known as tidal lagoons, which can be attached to the shoreline or located fully offshore, but which work on similar principles to the barrage. Tidal stream technology, on the, on the other hand, exploits the energy in relatively high-speed sea currents. These devices extract energy from water flow, uh, rather like a windmill but underwater. Um, it is with the help of support provided under the DTI's technology programme that the UK is now well positioned as a world leader in the development of this new technology. Um, yes, I'm happy to, yes. Very good. I'll I'll just take this uh, opportunity to add my support to uh, the Honourable Member for, for North Avon for uh, a speedy reappraisal of, of tidal power in the, in the Severn Estuary. And my apologies to you, uh, Sir Nicholas, for arriving a little late at the beginning of this uh, debate. Would the Minister agree, though, that the um, tidal flow technology he's uh, describing is actually more suitable for deep water environments, so in this context, further out in the Bristol Channel, and actually could be provided additionally to uh, lagoon or barrage technology, uh, whichever route we, in the end, decide is the most environmentally beneficial. Um, I'll come away. Yes, I, I would agree with the broad thrust of that, and, and just in, in, in terms of distinguishing the different forms of, as it were, marine technology. I, w I wasn't suggesting this as an alternative to the idea of a, a seven barrage. It was just a, another example. It is another example of how, given um, that we are an island, um, there are different ways of exploiting the, the, power, power of, the power of the sea. Now, of course, we already have a good understanding of tidal power. Um, the UK, having spent considerable sums of money in the past, some £20 million, pounds, in all, evaluating the potential for generating electricity from tidal barrages. The UK tidal programme ran from 1978 to its completion in 1994 and was the most comprehensive ever undertaken anywhere in the world. A number of schemes were studied under the programme, the largest being a seven barrage, which would have a capacity of uh, 8,600 megawatts and an output of, of 17 terawatt hours a year, providing around 5% of current UK demand from a renewable source and saving some 7 million tonnes of CO2 a year over its 120-year projected lifetime. A seven barrage would be one of the largest civil engineering projects in the world and by far the largest single renewable energy generation scheme here in the UK. 
It would involve building a 10-mile long barrage between the Severn Estuary and the Bristol Channel, just downstream of a line between Cardiff and Western Supermare, and enclosing some 140 miles of coastline. Uh, I do not have time to go into great detail, but a project on this scale would clearly be very complex with, it, with numerous advantages and disadvantages which we need to appraise and discuss. At the current estimate of £15 billion, it would be expensive, and from any decisions to take it forward could take as long as 12 years to build and commission. However, as well as providing 5% of our electricity, it could bring additional benefits, such as a reduction in the likelihood of increased flood damage in the Severn region and an estimated 35,000 jobs at the peak of construction. The promotion of a barrage would require compliance with a wide range of environmental legislation, as the Honourable Gentleman implied, the seven estuaries of national, European and indeed international nature conservation significance, and so has been afforded the corresponding levels of legal protection. It is designated as both a Ramsar site and a special protection area under the EU Habitats Directive and is in the process of being designated as a special area of conservation. The estuary also comprises a series of sites of special scientific interest. The scale of environmental changes that will be introduced by a barrage would be very large, and there is no doubt that with the loss of around 65% of the intertidal areas, a barrage would have a major impact on the ecosystems of the Severn estuary. Although I acknowledge the point the Honourable Gentleman made, that you, that can be argued, as it were, to and, 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 and fro. There are e ecological benefits as, as well as ecological disbenefits, and that's part of the complexity and interest in this subject. Now, the Energy Review recognised the potential benefits of tidal power schemes, but also the environmental concerns a seven barrage would raise. We therefore committed to a major £400,000 study. That study is currently underway, being led by the Sustainable Development Commission, working together with the DTI, the Welsh Assembly Government, DEFRA, and the South West Regional Development Agency. Um, the SD, SDC is the government's independent advisory body on sustainable development. Uh, one aspect of the SDS, SDC's role is to engage to understand um, what members of the public and stakeholders believe is the best way forward when solving a problem. And given the SDC's role and expertise and the complexity of the issues, the SDC are well placed to carry out this work. Yes, please. Yeah. Steve Webb. I'm very grateful. I, I wonder if the Minister could clarify the, the kind of output he expects from the Sustainable Development Commission in the sense of is there a danger they say, yeah, it's a really good idea, we must do more work. I mean, isn't there a danger we just get another review and another review? What's going to be the, the, the thing that clinches it? Well, let, me, oh, let me just continue with where we are on the study. Um, th thank you, Sir Nicholas. The study is not only looking at all aspects, I should say, of and options for tidal power, both in the Severn Estuary and the wider UK, but importantly will help provide us with a much better understanding of the public position on the acceptability of any Severn Barrage development. And the SDSC is undertaking a major stakeholder engagement and public consultation exercise. Uh, maybe they can draw on the experience of the Honourable Gentleman which includes a national survey and a number of regional public and stakeholder workshops. A final report by the Commission setting out its position and its advice to government on tidal power is expected in July and obviously will serve to inform any future considerations. Um, I hope the Honourable Gentleman would, would, would agree that this is you know, not just another study. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a significant um, exercise uh, it involves the key players in terms of the agencies in England and Wales. And I think with the public consultation element, um, it will produce a, a very, very important um, report. I mean, I, I hear what the Honourable Gentleman was saying in terms of why don't we just get on with it and uh, volunteering myself to head forward with his help with my bucket and spade. But I, I, I do think, given the complexity, it's not unreasonable quite a bit of time after the last proper study that we look at this very carefully and, and government considers the SDC report um, very ca carefully. So once again, I'm very grateful, um, Sir Nicholas, uh, to, to the Honourable Gentleman for enabling this discussion to take place. 
I think it's been a, a useful contribution um, to the debate. Um, certainly government fully recognises the potential contribution that tidal energy in its different forms could make towards our goals. And that includes the tidal resource potential that exists within the Severn um, estuary. He will, of course, appreciate that I cannot comment on the detail of the forthcoming energy white paper, but I can assure him and colleagues that the issue of tidal power, including within the Severn, will be covered in the forthcoming white paper. The question is, I thank the House uh, for that most interesting debate. There are advantages of being in the chair. You can actually learn something. Uh, and I think the House is grateful to both the uh, member for North Avon and the Minister for replying. The question is that the sitting be now adjourned. Order, order.